When the phone rings in the middle of the night, it almost certainly means bad news. Unless you're Arthur McDonald. For the Canadian physicist, it was a life-changing call from Stockholm, Sweden. McDonald was told he'd won the Nobel Prize in physics for his work on neutrinos, a fundamental building block of our universe. Joining us now for more on his work and what his win means for science in Canada, in Kingston, Ontario, Arthur McDonald, Professor Emeritus at Queen's University and co-winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Have you got used to hearing that yet, Nobel <laughs> Prize winner? Actually not. Uh, I was thinking exactly that when you said it. That kind, kind of sounds strange. You don't get <laughs> sick of being congratulated? Well, I, you know, I have so many people to share these congratulations with. We have altogether about 270 authors on our papers, and they're all overjoyed that all of their hard work has been recognized in this way. Uh, what time did the call actually come in? Oh, about 10 after 5. And you were asleep? Morning. You were asleep? I was. And uh, just take a minute. Share, us, uh, sh share uh, your feelings of how that moment went. Well, it was, it was kind of unreal. Uh, the uh, person on the other end was the chairman of the, uh, of the committee, and he uh, told me that he, uh, that he had the honor to inform me that I had uh, and won this prize along with uh, Professor Kajita from uh, the Super Cameo Candy experiment. And uh, so I uh, <laughs> uh, sat down to begin with <laughs> <laughs> because it was uh, really a, a shocking uh, bit of news. And uh, then the various members of the committee uh, came on in sequence. And uh, uh, the final person to come on was Lars Bergstrom, who happens to be from Matt, Sun Matt Sundin's hometown. And he reminded me of a conversation we had had uh, uh, about a year and a half ago in which we were talking about hockey and the Toronto Maple Leafs in particular and uh, <laughs> I told him we still needed mats so uh, at that point I knew it wasn't a hoax uh, which I had heard about it occurring to other people. It's funny how almost every story gets back to the Toronto Maple Leafs if it's a uh, anyway. If you're a fan. If yeah, you're a fan. Right. <laughs> yes indeed. Well let's talk about what you in fact uh, were rewarded for and we'll start by just asking you what's a neutrino? Well, a neutrino, uh, along with electrons and quarks, are the basic building blocks that we don't know how to subdivide any further. They all participate uh, in what has been uh, referred to as the standard model of elementary particle physics. In that model, they were postulated to have no mass and therefore travel at the speed of light. And uh, th what we were able to demonstrate, in fact, is that they do have a finite mass. And we did that by showing that uh, they changed after being created in the sun into one of the other two types, there are three altogether, before they reached the earth. And uh, uh, in order to do that, we were uh, uh, fortunate to have uh, a real Canadian resource, heavy water, and that measurement was conclusive. Uh, and uh, that was back in 2002, so it's been quite a while since the uh, measurements were recorded. Uh, but these neutrinos uh, are uh, so fundamental that being able to determine that they have a finite mass is extremely important in terms of how the, uh, uh, the basic laws of physics work. And in fact, the standard model now has to be revised in order to give them a mass within the model. So we have new understanding of how all this works, and I wonder how you were able to demonstrate, uh, obviously to your colleagues and then ultimately to the Nobel people, uh, what it was that you were putting forward. Well, um, <clears throat> it turns out that uh, if neutrinos in fact change from the type produced in the core of the sun, they're called electron neutrinos, into uh, one of the other types, uh, that's a, a phenomenon that simply can't happen unless they have a finite mass. And uh, that's exactly what we demonstrated. And we did so by having uh, uh, two reactions using uh, the heavy water. Each of them, when a neutrino hit uh, the nucleus of deuterium in heavy water, uh, each of them produces a burst of light, but different bursts of light, and so we could distinguish them. And uh, what we found was that the reaction that gives us a measure of exactly how many of the electron neutrinos from the sun survive, and compared it with the other reaction that tells us the sum of all neutrino types, only about one-third had survived. Two-thirds of them had changed their type. Hmm. And so it was a very conclusive uh, result, one that we referred to as being correct within about five standard deviations or more than a uh, hundred million uh, to one that it was incorrect. 
So that measurement uh, was uh, very substantial for electron neutrinos. The um, Super Kamiya Candy experiment did a similar thing for neutrinos that are produced in the atmosphere. They're called muon neutrinos. They change their type in traversing the Earth. And so the combination of the two experiments really uh, was very definitive in knowing that uh, neutrinos had to be treated differently at the very basic level of uh, what we know in uh, elementary particles hmm. these days. Professor McDonald, there have to be a million, if not 10 million, unknowable things in our world, and yet this is the one that you decided you needed to resolve. Why this one? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> first of all, because neutrinos themselves are, are uh, very important particles in terms of, uh, uh, of how the universe has evolved, in how stars burn, in how stars explode, and uh, things of a very fundamental nature of both physics and astrophysics. Um, and there was a puzzle. Um, there were a number of experiments that had made measurements of the numbers of neutrinos coming from the sun and had found that there were uh, appear apparently uh, only one third of them were surviving by the time they came to the Earth. Um, that was in comparison to calculations that had been done that were thought to be very accurate. And uh, so the question was, is that in fact what was happening, that they were changing to another type which had all these implications that we were eventually able to uh, uh, define? Uh, or uh, is it simply that the calculations were incorrect, uh, which would have had other significant, uh, uh, let's say, negative effects because uh, we think that we understand how to calculate those very hot fusion reactions in the core of the sun. That's what gives us confidence that we can develop fusion power uh, here on Earth using similar sorts of calculations. And if they were wrong, it, we would have been back to the drawing boards on that. Because we could be definitive about a, a question that had been, you know, put on the table for a number of years, uh, it motivated uh, the uh, hundreds of people that worked on our project to work very hard starting in 1984 uh, and eventually receiving their final result in 2002 uh, because it was such an important question in science. Hmm. I think it was about 15 or 20 years ago that I visited the, the uh, neutrino lab that you built uh, in Sudbury, I don't know, is it a mile or two under the surface of the Earth? I mean, it's a long way down there. Two kilometers. Two kilometers, okay. And um, I guess I'm wondering how significant to your eventual discovery um, having the support of that local community was, uh, the university, Laurentian, the people in Sudbury, to eventually getting to the finish line. Extremely important. Uh, we uh, started with uh, very strong support from uh, the company Inco at the time, it's now uh, called Valet after it had been purchased, but uh, at the time Inco, uh, right from the start when uh, they were approached about the possibility of a fundamental science experiment being, take, being carried out in their mind uh, in such a way that uh, they could do something that's really unique, and in fact what it is unique and it's uh, still taking place with an expansion of the laboratory for other experiments, it is the lowest radioactivity location uh, or I should say laboratory, uh, currently in operation in the world. Uh, but the Sudbury community, uh, the uh, participation of Laurentian scientists first and foremost, uh, they really uh, took very substantial roles being situated in Sudbury. The department has been expanded. There's a Canada research chair in this area in the department. It's uh, really uh, major contributions. But the community itself, the local politicians, went to bat for us in terms of uh, getting approval for a wide variety of things. Science North, uh, really one of the top uh, science centers in the world, uh, from what I've observed, uh, gave us the opportunity to interact with the uh, general public, uh, created a so-called object theater, which they're excellent at, uh, explaining what we were doing and uh, educating all kinds of uh, school children uh, uh, in this area of science. Uh, so the community as a whole, and, and the, uh, I have people say to me, I'm impressed with how the taxi driver I took getting to the, to the laboratory was so enthusiastic about what you're doing. <laughs> so it was very important to us. And yet we hear from some of your colleagues at the Perimeter Institute that you've had a considerable amount of pushback from some in the scientific community to what you were trying to prove in the first place or whether it was in fact doable. 
well, whether it was doable uh, <laughs> was something we worried a lot about ourselves mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the fact that we were trying to build a detector the size of a 10-story building in an ultra-clean environment, two kilometers underground in a very active nickel mine. Uh, Valet is still uh, taking lots of, uh, of uh, uh, ore out of that mine every single day. Uh, on the other hand, if, uh, I mean, you say there were some doters, but uh, every peer review that we went through for this project was very positive. Uh, we had to uh, uh, combine a number of agencies' uh, support and the government's support in order to get the finances in the first place. But that was on the basis of very solid peer review by uh, panels of scientists, knowledgeable scientists, and that's the way the scientific community works. You uh, put forward your proposals, you have them reviewed by knowledgeable people, and uh, if they're successful, then you hope that the funding agencies are able to uh, respond. So. Uh, uh, I guess I uh, always was thinking of this in a fairly positive way, just based on the words that were on paper as to uh, what the reviews said. Okay, in which case, let me ask you about Canada versus the United States, because I think you, you were at Princeton, right? Uh, yes, I was a professor at Princeton when, uh, when I uh, became involved in the project, and uh, I'm originally from Nova Scotia, but uh, uh, I uh, then came back to uh, Canada in uh, 1989. Well, that's what and, I want to ask uh, about. I, wa yeah. I wonder why, I mean, clearly there, the, in the United States, uh, there's no shortage of foundation money to put into scientific research, and they seem to have massive resources to be able to bring to bear, and yet you came back to Canada to do this, and uh, I wonder why. Well, um, <clears throat> Canada had some natural advantages in, uh, in doing this, and, and I think when you're when you're trying, I mean, big science is uh, only about 1% or so of the total expenditure in, uh, uh, in uh, science uh, in Canada. And uh, uh, it's uh, important, I think, when you're choosing things to do, to pick things where you may have some natural advantages. The natural advantages we have here is that we had the deepest potential laboratory in the world, uh, thanks to the uh, support of INCO at the time. And we had the availability of uh, a thousand tons of heavy water from Atomic Energy of Canada uh, with the assistance of uh, Ontario Power Generation. And that material, heavy water, was really unique. No other country in the world had uh, such resources and no other experiment um, was capable of making the measurement that we made where we measured two things, the, the type that were produced in the sun and the sum of all the types, including the ones they changed into. That's what made the experiment possible. And uh, yes, it was daunting when we started out uh, trying to uh, uh, see whether it was possible. Uh, but uh, the simulations we made back then uh, proved to be very correct. Uh, once we worked very hard, and this is a team of uh, Canadian, American, and UK scientists working together. Uh, <coughs> to make it happen, uh, we ended up with, with our results that were what you might expect if, in fact, neutrinos changed from one type to the other. Hmm. Let me uh, just finish up on this angle, and that is, uh, I can remember talking with John Polanyi about his Nobel victory and how many more people took his phone calls after he won that award than, say, before. So with a new Liberal government now uh, in Canada, um, you have an opportunity, I would think, to start to influence um, scientific policy and political engagement in science as never before. What are you going to tell the Liberals if they reach out to you, or if you reach out to them, about what they need to do to encourage more scientific innovation in this country? Well, uh, I think there, the Canada actually has been very successful under a number of programs that uh, were put in place uh, starting in the 1990s. Uh, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Canada Research Chairs, uh, scholarships, uh, indirect funds to universities, a number of things that were intended to support academic research. And in fact, the uh, results of that are such that uh, Canada has increased its stature in the world significantly in that area. Um, uh, I think right now there's a, a difficulty in that there's been a lot of capital equipment that has been uh, uh, provided, which is fantastic in terms of getting things uh, uh, going in science, and that's part of the reason why there has been uh, uh, such success. Uh, every par piece of, par of, uh, of capital equipment, of course, needs to be operated eventually, and I think the agencies are just in the process of getting uh, their acts together in terms of making sure that they are uh, supporting appropriately 
uh, projects across the country. And that's not just big science. It's, it's, uh, it's the people who are getting individual grants from uh, agencies like NSERC, for example, that uh, are finding that uh, operating support for such research uh, and to really get return on investment from all of this uh, equipment that has been uh, purchased uh, requires a careful uh, examination. So I would suggest that that's something that they do. Um, I think they uh, could benefit from having a uh, science advisor within their, uh, uh, with their, within their organization in, in the government, someone who is uh, you know, a very experienced person that's uh, capable of helping them uh, analyze the things that are being presented to them. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, if they did those couple of things, that would be a real good start for uh, uh, you know, a, a future uh, uh, program. Of course, it's very important that um, uh, the way in which science is uh, uh, dealt with in this country is very open, transparent. Scientists feel as though they are able to speak their minds. And uh, so uh, I'm very hopeful that that's also going to be uh, something that uh, this new government uh, takes very seriously. Understood. Professor MacDonald, uh, let us here at TVO add our voices to uh, the many you've heard so far in congratulating you on this uh, extraordinary honor, and we thank you so much for coming on TVO tonight to tell us about it. Thank you. I hope this will be good for Canada and Canadian science. Here, thank here. you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.